Welcome to our latest podcast of Insights into Success. Today our special guest is Mike Pero. Mike is well known for establishing in 1991 Mike Pero Mortgages, which has grown into a nationwide chain, followed by Mike Pero Real Estate, which was established in 2011 and equally is now represented throughout New Zealand. Prior to all this, however, Mike found time to become a six times national motorcycle champion and also a commercial pilot. All right, Mike, so thank you so much for taking the time to um, share with us today on Insights into Success. And I have to say that you have had an incredibly varied life. When I reviewed um, your history, it's quite amazing what you've, you've done. But what I would like to do, if you're okay with this, is start off by you telling us a little bit about your upbringing way back in the early days in Christchurch. Yeah, well, um, I was brought up in Christchurch in uh, a suburb of Wainoni near Aranui. And um, I, uh, gee, it's going back a few years, but uh, yeah, it, it was very modest, uh, or well, I'd say even poor, our family. Um, right. Mum and Dad got a, a state advance loan. Um, bought a house for, off the top of my head, a, a couple of thousand pounds. And, and uh, yeah, I, it was very basic. Um, grew up, uh, went to Aranui Primary School, uh, Avondale, Chisnerwood School, Shirley, and then Shirley Boys High School um, by the time I was uh, in my teenage years. So um, living on the east side was very simple. I didn't know a lot about knew nothing about business we just lived each day as it came and yeah but my parents were hard workers and um yeah it so, was, so what was your fondest memories or some of your fondest memories back in those days i think um um just growing up uh, with family and cousins and um we were always at the swimming pools um uh, there was a swimming pool called the lido uh or waltham swimming pool and uh it was, we used to spend all our time there, weekends, and with our cousins all about the same age, just playing as, as uh, you know, those are the days you get on the bike or the bus and you're a seven or eight year old and yeah. head off and parents didn't actually, there was no concerns about your safety or no. uh, maybe it was a little naive, or they were all naive then, but we'd just go off and come home at the end of the day and yeah. it was so different. And was um, your imagine, imagination a key part of your entertainment? Yeah, yeah. Um, there was some things I, I used to be, I remember just lying on the, at the sand dunes at the back of our house and just looking out the sky and watching planes go past. Not that I at that stage knew what I was going to do in the future. Yeah. Um, but I, I didn't, life was so simple, simple and it was the simple things in life that um, we didn't, as I say, it was a very poor, the whole neighbourhood was poor. poor. Um, yeah. It was the east side of town uh, in Christchurch, which is, um, you know, pretty, um, it, pr it was pretty poor. Right. So tell me, Mike, I understand that your father uh, is originally mm. from the Cook Islands. Mm. To what extent did your ethnic background play a part in your upbringing and ultimately your career? Uh, my, my father came across from the Cook Islands in the late 50s, met my mum who's English. Yeah. Um, Dad passed away eight years ago. Mum's still alive and well. Um, it was an interesting, it was two different cultures. Um, I came along a couple of years later. Dad didn't get the education um, that most of us get today. Yeah. Um, so he was a hard worker, so he inspired me um, I look back now, in fact my mum made the comments, she's so proud of me, she said the other day and it was nice to get a text from mum to say I'm so proud of what you're doing. Wow. Um, and I said, look mum, um, remember your genes, you've inspired me. Yeah. Mum's in her 80s so she's quite chuffed with that. Um, but she said, and your dad helped, I'm sure, and yes he did. He yeah. was a hard worker, yeah. gave me the drive, and uh, um, I'll always remember him for that, always hard working. And, yeah. um, and, and mum was probably the marketer. I uh, don't think marketing was around in those days <laughs> so much, but she was the one that had um, a, a bit of an artistic flair, attention to detail and yeah. making things look good. Um, and that's all, you know, to me, um, part of my marketing is making something look good. Yeah. Um, perception is reality, as we know. Mm. So 
make things look good, um, make them desirable. Uh, people are going to um, um, be attracted to your product or your service, and then you know it's it's just like you know going fishing or hunting. Um, you want the fish to come your way when you drop your mm. um, line over the edge. And so, so you know, often we see people that grow up in poor communities, mm. and sometimes from minority ethnic groups as well. Uh, we see that they almost get trapped in that cycle and never get out of that. Mm. What would be your message to them, being someone that really you know, came from a poor background mm. and it was of mixed um, ethnic uh, origin, mm. what would be your message to them so that they don't just fall into the trap of feeling they can't get out and do something more for themselves? Well, look, um, different cultures, and, and particularly we'll say Pacific Island people, yeah. um, haven't been exposed to all the commercial factors that by living in New Zealand all your life and being brought up in, in central Auckland might be, or Wellington, Christchurch, wherever, um, they've had a different lifestyle, their values are different for a start and so they're quite happy for a lot of them um, not to take on a, a career in economics mm. in the past. And so, but look, in, in reality, they're just as capable, mm. uh, it's just a lot of them haven't had the desire or the opportunity. Yeah. Um, but look, I've learned um, that you can do things. Things that actually, in some cases, not all cases, seem to me to have been easier than I thought. Until I tried something, I didn't realise it was possible. Right. I mean, there's a lot of things uh, that people from other um, ethnic backgrounds could do far better than us yeah. um, back in their home. But when they come to New Zealand, um, or if, um, uh, like me, came from a poor neighborhood never got the chance to try things but you know sometimes things are easier than you expect uh, there are plenty of people in this country that can help you um, mm. don't um, never say never yeah because I've learned so many things if I thought you know the young Michael Pero from Aranui was going to be an airline pilot was going to be a business owner was mm. going to start an airline mm. You wouldn't have believed uh, I, I, it back I in the day, would you? Sometimes mum reminds me and, and just yeah. says, I'm so um, proud of you, Michael. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, well, actually, no one's more surprised than me. <laughs> yeah. But it just took, um, for me, it was standing up on the podium with that trophy yeah. made me, my chest was all puffed. I thought, yeah. Oh, yeah. And look, you know, I'll tell you one thing, and we all know, um, a lot of the Pacific people are good at sport. They are. And, and, and the sport is it gives them confidence. Mm. Plenty of all blacks, you know, a large mm. percentage of rugby players and netball and all the other sports come from those. Uh, and then they go on in business. And yeah. um, so confidence is a huge part. So at that age, do you recall what you wanted to be when you grew up? Probably a fire engine driver. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't even think that far ahead right. uh, until. Look, even at, at, at secondary school, at, you know, in my teens, I didn't really know what I was going to end up doing. Um, no. I, I, and what about your motorcycle racing? Mm. Um, at what point did you get interested in that? What drew you to it? Um, look, I was 15. I got on the back of a motorcycle with my cousin Chris. Took me for a ride on his Yamaha 250, and yeah, did 100 mile an hour. Um, Actually, that was a bit above the speed limit, I guess. Um, <laughs> but um, I thought, wow, this motorbike's got my adrenaline going. So started working hard, bought my own motorbike, my own Yamaha 250, yep. and thought, wow, this is fast. Uh, within a year, I was on the racetrack, um, wow. Royal Puna back in the day, and um, that was just so much, um, so much fun that I thought, yeah, um, I should get into this motorbike racing on a more serious note. So I did, and. We'd go out in the weekends. Meanwhile, I'd lost my license on, on the road for speeding on a motorbike. <laughs> um, so the only place I could actually ride it right. was on the racetrack in the weekends. So right. I'd go round and round and round and had no idea that I was getting better and better and better. So the first race meeting came up, me and a couple of my mates, we all started together. We were first, second and third. Um, really? You know, in, the, in, in the club racing, then we thought we'd go into the national series and have a go at that, which was throughout New Zealand from uh, Invercargill to Auckland and um, 
wow, uh, my first attempt to win the New Zealand up to 410cc production championship series uh, over six rounds and I was a New Zealand champion. Well, so that was the first Amazing. of six. Yeah. And at that stage, how big a, well, it must have been a big part that played in winning though was your bike, surely. And, and how did yeah. you fund it though? Because you... Uh, yeah, look, that's where I started learning about selling. Um, so as a motorcycle mechanic, I ended up leaving school worked in a cardboard factory for six months then I got an apprenticeship so I learned how to uh, and I was an apprentice motorcycle mechanic so right. I knew how to fix bikes and for the next four years that's what I did is fixing motorbikes um, and at the same time coincidentally I realised that I could fix my own racing bikes, race them, I was a good, I was very competitive and so um, each year I'd win another national championship and I won two two years in a row so won all the events that I really wanted to, to win um, and yeah I, I um, considered going offshore one or two meetings in Australia my brother chose to go the other way and make a profession out of it which he did successfully right through to the 90s right. um, 1990s I ended up after several years of winning um, setting up a motorcycle shop a Yamaha dealership in 19... 81, I was 21 years old and I had my first business as a licensed motor vehicle dealer. So one thing led on to another. So you actually ended up though with six, um, you're six times a mm. road racing champion, six mm. times and according to what I researched it looks like you possibly still hold the land speed record for a 350cc. Yes, um, that That's comes amazing. up quite a bit. Oh, well, I, I set it in 1979, uh, I was 19 years old and we set it and today it remains unchallenged, I'm waiting for someone to do it. It wouldn't be hard to beat that today but no one's tried. tried. Um, but look, uh, yeah, I look back, the championships meant more to me than the one-off uh, land speed record um, but uh, the championships were hard work, it needed money. I yep. needed uh, reliable machinery. I was lucky that Yamaha New Zealand uh, was my sponsor, so my machines were always delivered to me. Um, I was lucky there, um, but I also needed sponsorship money to, to fund right. on top of that. So I, I basically knocked on doors, continually looking for sponsorship. So I would put proposals to them, which would be, in those days, typed up um, by my... Um, fiance at the time and right. um, she'd type and help me with the proposals so I'd go in and talk to everyone from Kodak in New Zealand wow. back then um, and then I just I was just knocking on doors looking for money basically I was lucky I came across a company called Adler, Adler Typewriters German company and just, they said yeah we're interested we'll back you okay. and so they wrote a cheque um, each year for a number of years for me and that got me continued funding my racing so in return I'd um, have advertising on my bike of course yep. on my racing machinery and all my equipment team and then I'd report back to them after each meeting and they were quite impressed they were quite proud to say that they supported um, my Piro racing at the time and right. so it was a win-win and I was thinking well this is good if I'm nice to people and do a good job and attention to detail um, then I'm going to get more money so I picked up Shell Oil um, had Yamaha New Zealand, Adler, um, a number of other little, mm. so I was uh, on a much, much more <laughs> scale like a America's yacht, like you look yeah. at the yachts, yeah. um, and you need all these sponsors, you have a couple of big ones and then you stage it, we, we had different levels of sponsorship, um, but for me that was like I could, um, relative to my uh, day job, I could get a year's income just by knocking on doors to fund my racing. So in hindsight, do you think that that experience has probably been beneficial to you through your career, you know, that skill well, that you learned from look, that, and the lessons you learned? Yeah, I, it did. Perseverance, and so many times it's come back to me, and I remember back to my days of motorsport and knocking on doors, and look, it, it's a numbers game. Whether you're selling life insurance, mortgages, real estate, aeroplane seats, whatever, yeah you'll see that most things come back to um, the amount of energy you put into things. Yeah. So talk me through from there. So at this stage you 
um, owned your own uh, motorcycle shop, mm. but at some point you ended up an airline pilot. So how, how did that transition happen? A lot happened in a <laughs> short period of time. Uh, okay, so uh, I was 21 when I had a motorcycle business. Um, I sold that, uh, within 18 months I'd sold out to my partner, decided to change tack again and um, I wanted to be a sales rep. I'd realised that working out the back, um, getting my hands dirty was hard work. As a mechanic it was an hourly rate, I figured there got to be a smarter way. Yeah. So I decided I wanted to get into sales. So um, I, uh, was, I got a position at Woolworths Variety Store, um, sort of a bit like Kmart. Um, and I worked there for another year. I got to understand sales, merchandising, uh, shop displays and that sort of thing. That led on to a job at Hansel's uh, in the grocery trade. Right. Hansel's Essences and Vita Fresh and all those things. And I got a company car and here I was <laughs> 23 thinking, wow, this is a pretty good number. Um, and I was, I enjoyed uh, so my business, my job was calling on supermarkets and selling right. in stock and and bonuses and all that sort of stuff. That led on to life insurance. So I was selling life insurance within another 18 months. Wow. Um, I was told I'd double my income if I left um, grocery sales and took on a life insurance position, which yep. I did. Uh, he was wrong. I didn't <laughs> double my income, I quadrupled it. Really? So um, here I was. We're talking uh, this stage of 85, 86, 1986, 26 year old. I was earning, uh, within a year, I was earning well over $100,000 a year back then. Wow. That's when the average property value was uh, $25,000 to $30,000 for a house in, in Christchurch. Yeah. Um, I was earning four times that. I had the latest car, I had this, and that. everything was coming together. Uh, and then I, so I did that for a further. Um, two or three years and then I decided I want to be an airline pilot. So totally... Um, and how field. did that come about, do you remember? What sparked... Um, I was selling life insurance to a couple of Air New Zealand pilots and I thought, wow, that's... Uh, you know, I was, I was in awe of what they'd done and and one of them was ex Shirley Boys High and Steve said, oh, it's easy, you just, re you know, just do this course here and do this and do that and I thought, wow. Imagine that, and you know, at this stage I, I could hardly spell physics, but um, <laughs> I, I knew I had to study physics, maths, and all the other things. But I did a course at Nelson Aviation College in Motueka, yep. and um, one thing led to another: commercial pilot. And then I took it a step further with the goal of being airline, and um, so did private pilot's license, commercial, um, right through to. ATPL, Airline Transport Pilots Licence, which is a requirement to get into Air New Zealand yeah. or any airline. And, and um, yeah, gosh, it just next thing I was working for Mount Cook Airline in Auckland, um, based up uh, in Auckland with, um, uh, yeah, I was on the, um, on the next uh, set of interviews for Air New Zealand in 1989. Right. Unfortunately, at that stage, Air New Zealand, um, uh, like most airlines, uh, had a, um, a period where they weren't recruiting. In fact, they were laying off pilots for a while. Right. It was just bad timing. So, just my luck. Spent all this money, all this time getting there. So I decided mm. at that stage, I'd change tack again and go towards, as it was, mortgages. And, and what's in particular drew you to going into mortgage brokering? Um, look, I just really needed uh, bread on the table at that stage. I'd um, spent a lot of money, the best part of $50,000 on my logbook for flying, which was pretty much worthless. Um, and a logbook is no value outside of aviation. I decided that the way things were, you wanted to be under the age of 30. I was coming up to 30. Right. Airlines really wanted to recruit people or pilots under the age of 30 and I was thinking this is this is not good timing so time to move on right so um, I didn't particularly go out to set up a mortgage business but I went back to life insurance what I knew well and I knew I could sell and um, at that stage I decided I was doing life insurance and people wanted home loans mm. and I thought well I'm, I, this can't be rocket science I'll learn how, how the banks do it and I ended up 
almost in my mind reverse engineering what banks were doing and thinking, well, okay, I got all the application forms and realised there's formulas in there that they were looking at a loan to value ratio mm -hmm. and a debt service ratio. And if that number is below that level, then you'll get your loan approved. So I, I basically realised that I could outsmart the banks. Well, not outsmart them, but I could understand that what people, they're looking for, what they're looking for, what they wanted, and what the customer wanted. Mm. If you connect the two, you've got mm. a, a loan approval. But so many people didn't know. They go in and say, "Oh, we want a loan," and the bank said, "Oh no, it doesn't fit. Goodbye." And I thought, well, yeah, but if you adjust this, if you get rid of that credit card, or if you yeah. do this, or if you get a flatmate and that gets your income up, uh, or this or that. So just a little bit of engineering, mm. and you've got a loan approved. Um, so and that was in the early days of mortgage brokering yeah. too, wasn't it? There was no other mortgage broker in New Zealand, bar none. There was no one doing what I was doing, right. and I couldn't believe it. Like there was oh, one guy I spoke to on the phone in Auckland, um, but and then I started helping people. Um, then Trust Bank Canterbury at the time said, "Look, we'll take your loans, um, we'll process them and prove them." And then then ASB came out onto the scene and. And, and the South Island, their global or their national expansion from just being an Auckland bank to across the nation. Yeah, they came in. We ramped up their volumes. Uh, then BNZ, National Bank, Westpac, and they all came in, and the business grew from there. So when you started out, did you envisage it becoming a, a um, multi-branch operation, or were you just thinking in terms of yourself and keeping yourself busy and making some money? Exactly. I was just thinking. Right. Um, Again, just this, um, just money on the table. If I can sell a mortgage effectively, and our service was free, so the banks would pay me for each loan I bring them. So I bring them a fifty thousand dollar loan. I would get paid two hundred fifty dollars, which is good money. If I did that twice a week, that's five hundred thousand, and so on. And then I was just, well, I was going to say lucky, but I was the only one working that hard to. Um, um, to, to help people, and, and it was a really good feeling, getting uh, helping uh, predominantly first home buyers right. into their first home. It was just so satisfying because I felt like Robin Hood, getting money <laughs> off the rich, the banks, and you know, helping people into their homes. homes. Yeah. So really, through your time though, you've shown a real propensity to do different things and to learn. Mm. Obviously, learn quite quickly. Yeah. Um, look, I think yeah, as I've gone through life, I thought. Okay, so if you do this, that, you get that. Um, but it's really two and two equals four. Mm. And so many things aren't as complicated. So-called professionals. Yeah. Um, I think, well, if somebody else can do something, why can't I? So confidence has grown significantly right. for me since I was a very shy, quiet boy in, uh, in class at school. I could not stand up in front of my class as I say, in front of three mates and string a sentence together. I was so nervous. Wow. Um, um, I didn't have confidence, um, very shy, and but I realised how much confidence can um, build success. Make a difference. That's the huge thing for me, because I don't consider myself sharp or bright. Um, I just, I'm just someone that works particularly hard um, at getting things to work. So do you think, like, touching back with your motorcycling, your success here, do you think that was largely because you just worked really hard? Yeah, look, I, I if I'm honest, I think I have, I had natural talent at the, how, how I stumbled across motorcycle racing, I don't know, <laughs> as being, because I wasn't much good at football or hockey or the thing, or athletics yeah. at school. And I stumbled across a sport. What are the odds of me being a, a New Zealand champion or, mm. uh, and, and winning events in Australia um, or New Zealand? And just being a natural, you know, the, what are the odds of me stumbling across that, having the right, knowing how fast to go around a corner yeah. without falling off? Typically, speeds of close to 200 kilometres an hour. Um, but it, it worked for me and, and it gave me confidence. and. The, as my confidence, standing up on the podium, taking the, you know, the trophy, yeah. the money, the cheque. I was making really good money back in those mm. days. More money today 
in motorsport, oh, sorry, back then, than there is today, today. in motorsport. We wow. could, I could earn a month's income in a day, um, for me, um, just by, you know, my sport, and it was fun. So, so that, yeah, so that success in motorcycling and the need for you to go out and get sponsorship really set a good foundation. It did actually, it in, in hindsight, it taught me to <clears throat> how to um, how to sell. I didn't even realise what I was doing. I was just looking for sponsorship, but um, uh, yeah, I had the confidence to go in and say I was a New Zealand champion and. And I, it was almost um, like um, it gave me the absolute confidence to ask for the big checks and yeah. and proposals, and I felt entitled to um, part of their annual budget. <laughs> so yeah, amazing. So, what made you then move on from mortgage brokering to real estate? So in 2011, you started the real mm. estate. So how'd that all Look, come about? Um, there was a big gap, and, and I sold uh, the real estate company. Uh, sorry, the mortgage company uh, in 2004. Right. And that was an interesting. Um, you know, I went from a one-man band to. Oh look, I can't even remember how many people were involved in the mortgage company back then, but um, it was hugely successful, um, and. I sold up then and I was in a position to retire at 45. And what made you sell? What was the reason for that? Okay, I t the, the story I've told a number of times, but <laughs> um, I um, had a company called South Canterbury Finance came in halfway through um, uh, the term and I did 15 years at mortgages, so from 19, um, pretty much 1990 to 2015. About five years into it, um, uh, South Canterbury Finance came along, wanted to buy a half share in the company. I thought, really, that's quite flattering. Um, what do you think it's worth? And they said, well, we think it's worth this amount. And I thought, yep, I'd take it. But then I thought, I'd better get some independent advice. I went to a, um, an accountancy firm and they said, you shouldn't be selling for that. They doubled the figure and they said, go back and tell them this. Well, I did and they said, Okay, we'll still buy it, and I thought, wow. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't believe it. I, you know, my, I clicked my heels and ran down the road, and um, back to the Mercedia. Um, then I realised, yeah, uh, and, and we got structure, and um, my fellow director appointed by South Canterbury was to be a guy called Humphrey Rolston yeah. in Christchurch, and I learned a lot from him about board, uh, a boardroom, and, and I. Because I'm by myself, I just ran the business. Mm. So we got some formality, some structure, and then they decided, um, we decided that one of us should take ownership. He said, Humphrey said, Mike, it's more fitting, it's your name, why don't you buy the business off us? And he said, that's what we think it's worth. Um, so I, I did, I paid him um, after valuation. I thought, yeah, okay. They made it really easy, it was, it was an amicable departure. Um, and then a couple of days later, or well, actually may have been weeks later, I got a call from a guy called Tim from a merchant banker and said, look, um, I've got someone to buy your business. I said, Tim, I've only just bought the other half back. I own 100%, it's not for sale. He said, I think you should, um, we should meet. And I said, well, wasting your time, but he says, I'll bring you a coffee. We'll have a chat around the table. Mm. So he brings his coffee and I, um, he says, right. And I said, Tim, I told you it's a waste of your time, not for sale. He said, Mike, this is the figure. So I said, <laughs> great, when do we meet the guy? <laughs> so within a 24-hour period, we'd signed up. Wow. Uh, a conditional sale to um, George Gould, another entrepreneur in Christchurch. Mm. Um, and uh, I had never seen so many numbers. I thought I'd won lotto. It was like winning lotto for me. So the deal went through. Three months later, it was unconditional, and mm. they took possession. And, and then George... To his credit, doubled the value. He took it to an IPO, doubled the value of the company, um, pretty much. Yeah. I remained on with him as a company director with shares, and um, finally sold them and thought, well, wow, got all this money. Now what? Next yeah. adventure. Yeah. So, so there was no. I didn't go straight into real estate. I, right. I bought shares in the airline, and um, <laughs> come back to that, and, and I also bought um, shares in a a flight simulator business, a oh, training device. Right, I remember so, that. So the, 
Um, so yeah, to carry on from there, I I, I had um, a foot in both camps, a real airline, Origin Pacific. Uh, so I was a 25% shareholder in that. Yep. That had its own set of problems, and uh, we were developing software to to uh, for a company that I was a, a, also a quarter share in with, um, a, a, and that was uh, flight training devices for uh, basically the Boeing 737 right. uh, aircraft, training airline pilots, and also there was an entertainment side to the business, so that you know anyone could have a go at flying a plane. So well, there were two separate parts of the business, but yeah. Mm. And how did you end up then getting into the real estate side? Well, I, I sold one of those and made a um, number of million dollars um, out of, and the other one, I'll let you guess, but one of the two, I lost a lot of money, <laughs> uh, which was the airline. The airline. So um, yeah. that didn't work out. I made a poor decision there. Yeah. I didn't feel I had absolute control there. Well, I had no control. Yeah. And uh, I bought in at the wrong time against my better judgment. I shouldn't have done it. Yeah. But a uh, good thing is the flight simulator business did well for me, returned significantly well. Um, so I was ahead. Um, there were a number of other businesses in between which I started, which a number of them are still going. And then I decided, um, uh, let's have a go at real estate. I'd done, or well, someone, there were a number of suggestions why didn't you get into real estate. So yeah. I already understood mortgages, mm. mortgages for home loans when someone buys or sells a home. So I thought I knew a wee bit about marketing. I dealt yeah. with real estate agents. I thought, hey, there's an opportunity for us to get into real estate. So started again from ground zero. Um, but I wanted to use my own name. Um, but I'd already sold that as a trademark with Mike Pure Mortgages. So right. I had to go back and ask them if I could have my name just for real estate. Uh, they were very interested and uh, said, look, why don't we go halves in this? We'll do the funding for you. We'll put the capital in. You put the um, the I well, yeah, yeah. the know-how, the yeah. IP, yeah. and um, we'll and they'll also allow me to use the name. And people will often say, "But it's your name. You can use it." Well, obviously, I'd sold the trademark, and I couldn't. So, in, in real estate, finance, and insurance, that had gone to the new owners. So. That's the way it is, I understand that. So they came back in. It was a real advantage to use the brand because mm. it was well established. Mm. And going out with a real estate name, uh, it got us off to a, we were off a springboard. Yeah, mm. yeah. And so since then though, you've, you've now moved out of real estate and yeah. you're looking at a, a new project mm. underway at the moment with mm. uh, Pacific Air. Mm. What's the motivation for that project? Well, um, look, I was sitting in my spa pool in Christchurch um, just as we're going into COVID, or, well, we had COVID. Uh, it was April last year, yeah. uh, 2020. And I, um, looking up at the sky, <laughs> no planes. Uh, it was deadly <laughs> quiet. And, and, and also thinking about the Cook Islands, how uh, there was uh, no connections, no planes flying. And I thought, OK, so fuel's down. In price, aircraft leasing's down. Mm. Uh, there's a need once we get through this, and I thought it would be shorter. Obviously, we all did thought would mm. be in and out and in a flash. So I started thinking about well, flights maybe out of Christchurch to the Cook Islands, maybe Wellington came up. So I, I decided that there's got to be an opening there. So right, it was COVID, um, and there were a whole lot of factors. There were a lot of unemployed pilots and flight attendants. Um, aircraft were cheaper. Um, I thought when we come out of lockdown, which we still haven't got this mm. bubble going yet, it's not far away, um, then there's going to be pent up tr travel um, desires and there seem to be a whole lot of reasons why you would consider an airline again, Yeah. or in my case again. Yeah, so I mean for you I guess it's a great example of someone who's trying to take a negative and turn it into a positive. You see, mm. negative situation with COVID, but through that potentially is an opportunity. Look, there's, uh, and now we look back over the last 12 months, uh, yes, a lot of businesses have been hit really hard, but there have been so many um, 
companies globally and in New Zealand that have done so done well, well and yeah. good on them. Uh, we would have bought Zoom shares um, <laughs> uh, way back in, uh, before COVID. Who would have thought um, mm. that's become part of life now? Mm, absolutely. Um, uh, so reflecting back now, what do you think have been some of the keys to your success over the years? Um, I think, uh, as you talk to most people in my position, uh, it's, it's been um, good ideas, hard work and timing. Um, there's, yeah, you could say there's a lot of luck, but I see the same factors coming up each time. No substitute for hard work, enthusiasm, persistence. Um, timing has a lot to do with it, so you've got to think not everything that glitters is gold, yeah. um, but at the same time, not everything when you start out um, is obvious which way you're going to go, but you've got to start walking down that path. Right, you've got to start somewhere. Mm. So do you think that people, some people are lucky, or do you think that the harder you work, the more you can generate the opportunity for luck to come your way? I mean, what's your view on the whole concept of luck? Look, yes, sure, some people are lucky. They might win a lotto um, uh, prize, or, um, but unfortunately, as statistics show, most of those people lose it within a few years. <laughs> I, I guess I've always, um, I've always worked hard, and um, as, as you just said, the harder I work, the luckier I get. I always remember that. And, right. and sometimes I'm working late at night. Even last night, I was working on, on the airline stuff, and I'm thinking, wow, it's now past midnight and I'm still going. I was up at 5.30 yesterday morning mm. um, and I finished the day at 12.30. Yes, I'm put, uh, there's a lot that happens in my days, more yeah. than one project. But I have to turn my head very quickly to something else, totally unrelated, make a decision. And, and you know, I'm running five or six businesses at once here mm. at the moment. And, but I don't fluff around during the day. I, um, I just get things done and um, but each 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 business I've just pushed myself a little bit harder than the average person might right in like reflecting on what you've just told me I mean you've done so many different things so do you think that that's um, helped you along your journey the fact that you've kind of had to do different things so you become quite adaptable versatile. and yeah versatile yeah look I definitely do I, I, I can I've got the confidence to take on most businesses. I just have to get the key fundamentals, understand the, the fundamentals, mm. and then think, right, um, now at, at this stage in life, I wish I knew uh, what I know today 40 years ago, yeah. um, because I would have done it a lot quicker and faster. But right. look, um, I just, for me, part of the reason I've taken on the challenge of an airline is that's the ultimate challenge. It's the, one of the hardest businesses mm. you could ever hope to, 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 to operate. There are so many aspects to it. Um, it's, it's like the ultimate game, um, having done all the other things, but at the end of the day, it's just bums on seats. It's just selling and making sure your expenses are less than your revenue. Yeah. And, but it's no different to a you know, cake shop you know, put your ingredients and all that and yeah. um, staff, but it's on a huge scale, it's huge and there's thousands of moving parts, mm. even the side of the aircraft, but there's so many things that have got to come together yeah. and uh, that to me is, is rewarding and I'm enjoying what we're doing now. So can we talk about any sort of situations you've been in where things haven't worked out and you've failed? Mm. I mean, along your journey, have you had many failures? Mm. Oh, look, uh, I've had maybe a handful, so five or more, gosh. Not big losses, uh, well, certainly, I guess you're talking millions, um, but individually, some of them, businesses have started and they've not worked out. I can say I've never um, been bankrupt, never, put a business into receivership or administration or yeah. I've never not paid debts, never had unpaid uh, creditors. Yeah. Sometimes I start a business, uh, well I go back years ago, but I'd start a business and I think I can see this not working right. and so I just sell off the vehicles or right. uh, just put everything back on the shelf and 
bite the bullet. So you were you were able to disconnect from the emotional and, and be clinical and just go right okay this isn't working because yep. you know how some people like they go so much down a path that they can't disconnect and be objective well and they just no they, they're just emotionally involved in it. yeah so look we'll, we'll turn it around but the hardest thing to do is is um, at times is to say this is not working and you know if you've got staff involved and say guys it's not working yeah um, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to make you redundant or whatever. I've never had to, well, I, haven't, I don't recall having to do that, but um, it is, I, I know a lot of businesses, uh, and today, uh, post-COVID, a lot of companies and small businesses have struggled to get mm. through. But look, it's better to take control and shut it down than be yeah. closed down. By somebody um, else. Yeah. yeah, it's not easy. And how do you view your failures? Like, and, I, and I don't want to preempt anything, but have they been really good learning experiences for you? Like, do you feel you learned more from your failures or not? I mean, what's your view? Look, um, yeah, you learn. Um, yeah, you learn the hard way that um, there, are, there have been failures, and um, you've just got to watch the figures, the trends. Um, and you've got to be realistic with yourself and think, um, where's this going? Uh, you do learn, and without doubt, you, it's the same feeling if you put your hand in front of a vicious dog, there's a good chance he may attack you or bite you, mm. so you won't do that again. Mm. Um, and the same with, um, you just got to be, when some, ha some people say, you know, feel the fear and go for it anyhow, but there may be fear there for a good reason. Cause yeah. it, you're going to lose some. You're going to lose your hand. Um, yeah. Look, there are times when you just feel that um, things aren't going well, and you might decide that you might. It could go either way. Mm. Uh, you've just got to drill down and, and be very diligent and aware of which way this is trending. And if it's trending south, and you've got not much in the way of reserves, then that's where it's better to, to you know address it and pragmatic because I think that's a real challenge for people because they get they get the message that you know to succeed you don't give up you you, you know you've got to keep pushing you don't give up but then the counterpoint is is sometimes maybe it's never going to work look and it's, it's like it leaving the casino just before you win because you know that the, the yeah. um uh the gambler just thinks one more spin yeah and I could be in and I would just recover everything. But you'll never know that that one was actually, as you went down the stairs, uh, that was a win, and there was you know a million dollars that would have come your way. Mm. Um, so I think I also hear a lot, um, you know, I bummed out of university, and yes, um, now I'm a millionaire, and mm. the, the, there'll be stories like that. I, I think um, Sir Richard Branson, mm. a huge success globally, um, and uh, yeah, he, he, I think he was a failed university graduate, but doesn't mean to say that that's part of the way you've got to fail university yeah, yeah. and now you're an entrepreneur yeah. and, and it's going to come your way. I, I wish in some ways I, you know, there was a bit of university for me in there, mm. but there wasn't. I could have done a lot better. Mm. So what do you think have been some of your greatest lessons so far in business? Hmm. Um, you know, sometimes I'll say, I should have gone with my gut instinct, I shouldn't have done this. Mm. Um, but then there have been other times when um, my gut instinct told me to do it. And it, there are so many situations um, and there's, uh, I think if, if people are watching this and are thinking, well, do I listen to my lawyers and my accountants? They said, no, but I did it anyhow. And there'll be people that said, you know, everyone said you, you weren't going to do it, but you weren't going to succeed, but I, I went against their judgment and I did succeed. But look, equally, there's so many times I thought, gee, I, my accountant said it doesn't look good. Mm. And I, I overrated my sort of skill set and thought, I'll turn it around. Right. And that was the case with um, the airline. I, uh, mm. Previous one, Origin, I thought, I can turn this around. But mm. um, sometimes you've got to face reality. So um, yeah, professional advice. Um, be objective. So many times um, 
Rachel, my wife, would look over my shoulder and she said, I just don't see this working. Yeah. <laughs> She's probably been right in a number of times that I've gone against, you know, and she said, I, I'm not going to say I told you so. <laughs> but um, fortunately, nothing super major. But right. I think, um, you know, a lot of people say, um, everyone thinks I should do this or... Uh, and that's an exaggeration in itself. Everyone, so everyone in the world, or everyone in the uh, everyone in the room, or or just well, I had two or three people. I, I love the one where people say, "Oh, everyone thinks this, and everyone thinks that." Well, tell me, Paul, how many people is everyone? Oh, well, actually, um, uh, Diane said that, and somebody else. So that's everyone. And yeah. you know, you can you can just generalise and and make anything sound like you've given it a lot of thought, and but in actual fact. It's only three people today, yeah. but um, you know, and, and a lot of people are encouraged. That, oh, this sort of, they reckon it's a great idea. Well, they probably say that because they want to you know, build your confidence because you want to start this little cake shop in the corner and they think it'll work. Everyone wants muffins. The muffins are real. Mm. Uh, you know, they're in vogue, so you should have muffin shop. But you've just got to make your own assessment and sometimes it, everything's oversimplified. On the other hand, some could be overcomplicated. So for you, you, from what I'm hearing, your gut's not 100% going with your gut. It's, it's kind of for you, it's been a balance between just being clinical and listening to your gut sometimes. Is that, is that right? Yeah, look, I, I, if I'm honest, sometimes my gut instinct is right. Sometimes I get it wrong. Um, but when I, when I do have a decision that is pretty important to me, I'll ask people who I have respect for yeah. and um, and I don't look you know for support from people that will just say yes all the time yeah you want um, objective answers yeah or... it's good to get objective and yeah. and I'll talk to people I'll think about things and then it's really right I'll go with that decision or um, yeah look um, it is, it's, you know, as I say, uh, business uh, and life is like snakes and ladders, chess and monopoly. It's like three games all at once, all in one. Mm. You, know, you get luck, snakes and ladders, good luck with the ladders, snakes, step, bad luck. Chess for strategy and all the time you're going around a monopoly board, yeah. you know, there's, there's a combination of all of those and you're dealing with issues. So. Um, Life's like that in business at times. Yeah. And what's, what would you describe as a key motivation for you? What really drives you and, and has pushed you on through your career? Um, probably the, the feeling of being competitive um, in business. And, and it, it actually does go back to what I learned in motorcycle racing. Sometimes you didn't get off to a good start. Okay, so I could see the others in front of me. Mm. I'd want to be up there and in front of them. And I knew that, you know, before the chequered flag, it might be a 15 or 20 lap race. I've got a certain amount of time to be there at the end front. And I'd have a strategy to get past them. I'd watch the way they move. I'd go, the, they'd zig, I'd, I'd zag. Or, yep. um, um, and so I knew where their weaknesses were. And businesses like that, you know where your competitor is and you go that way around them or you do this or do that. Mm. Um, I love the competition. Um, I used to get a real buzz out of being close to another bike as we go into a corner, try and outbreak him, or, uh, and it was often a him, uh, always a him, but um, go into the corner mm. inches away from each other and I just get around the corner uh, a little bit ahead of him yeah. and then take the chequered flag. Yeah. And that's all that mattered. I needed to win by that much or yeah. whatever. Um, and the same in business. I enjoy the, I, I do enjoy competition. Mm. I, I do love it when I'm, you know, when the business is doing well because mm. your streets ahead of the competitor. Yeah. And in mortgages, that was a great feeling because I couldn't believe I'd look around, and think, where are my competitors? No one else is doing mortgage broking. Today, there's a couple of thousand mortgage brokers. Yeah. So for you, though, would you say that? Um, the keys for you being successful have been that you're competitive, um, that you are adaptable, 
and what you do, uh, you're a hard worker, what, what sort of do you think would be the key elements for your success? I think I'm a, a hard worker. Um, all the way through I've, I've uh, surrounded myself by people that I believe in certain areas have more skill than me. Mm. Um, I'm just like the conductor, we're surrounded by good musicians and uh, whether it's Sam, Juanita, um, Natalie, all, you know, marketing, accounting, mm. legal, um, they're all specialists in their field. So I just, I, I think I, I think my skills are that I get on well with people, I yep. communicate well with my internal team and collectively I, I feel we make decisions um, and it's generally my decision at the end of the day to go this way or that way but it's been um, yeah hard work, it's been adaptability, adapting to situations, thinking on my feet but I'm also very cost conscious um, and aware and looking for deals, I love doing deals and negotiating and yeah. that continues and it always will. Yeah. I love the, I got a good deal and, and whether it's uh, you know, small things or you know, million dollars here and there, it's a good feeling. Yeah. And um, you're currently heading up the New Zealand version of The Apprentice. Mm. So what are you looking for in the contestants? Um, the, the candidates are um, already selected and we're just looking for somebody that's going to shine through all the way. So they're, they're given a number of tasks and like uh, uh, completely random tasks but it does require strategy, planning, leadership, teamwork and all this stuff. So we're ultimately funneling it down to the person who we believe has got what it takes. Right. Mm. And out of interest, what happens to the, the winner? What's what's the prize okay. at the end of it? The prize them? at the end is, is a fifty thousand uh, dollar cash bonus. Um, well that prize I should say. Yeah. Uh, for their business. And, and they're all they've all got their own little businesses. They're, all, oh, okay. they're in business already. Right. Um, plus um, a year of mentoring with uh, from myself, so right, yeah. And it's something like mentoring. Is that something that you've done before, or? Oh, look, um, you can call it what you like. Some people, well, I call it advice and direction. Um, mentoring is the buzzword. So, um, look, uh, I've sat down with people, and um, they've gone away and said, "Geez, that t changed my whole business plan." And and I know from the few businesses that I've helped that. I look at the success and I'm so proud to say that Dave, for example, has a business now that is worth millions of dollars Yeah. Um, and you know, we worked together for a while and um, I just sort of gave him some direction and yeah. turned uh, one-off sales into an ongoing lease contract passive income yeah. and, um, and up, oh, I just, just tweaked a simple, um, simple idea that I had with his business right. has made him millions of dollars and, and so I call that mentoring I suppose. Wow, that would be um, hugely satisfying. It is, yeah, yeah. Should have bought more shares in the company. <laughs> <laughs> well hindsight's twenty twenty, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so for anyone watching this or, or listening to this interview, you know, based on your experience, what would you suggest would be the keys for people to succeed? Uh, look, be prepared to work hard. I'd say never go in undercapitalised. If you think that you're, you don't have enough money but you're going to generate that, then um, just be very sure of what you're doing because most businesses in New Zealand or anywhere in the world for that matter fail because, they're, because of capital. Right, undercapitalised. Um, no one's, yeah, yeah, otherwise they wouldn't fail. It's, it's generally outgoings of exceeded income yeah. and, and they collapse. So. Uh, your capital needs are pretty, just like a foundation in any building. Um, be prepared to work hard. I talk about, we, we've talked about strategies and yeah, you've, you've just got to know your competitor. Don't underestimate your competitors. Um, there are probably, you know, a dozen different things that you want to be looking at mm. on your dashboard on a regular basis. And what about, because one thing that's come out of this interview for me is being pragmatic. Because you've really come across 
um, is having the ability to be pragmatic and go, you know what, honestly this isn't working, right, I'm going to cut it. Mm. What, what's your thoughts on that? Oh, you have to be honest. Um, in, business, um, in business, you've got a number of factors. Uh, it's just like running a vehicle. You've got the temperature, uh, the water temperature, oil pressure, speed, uh, this, this and that and all those other yeah. things. In an aircraft you've got a lot more instruments and you know a pilot is actually monitoring, or a couple of pilots generally up the front, are monitoring all these things. The minute something starts trending, you know, whether you're off track, whether you're, you know, turbines are running warmer than they should be or mm. more vibration, they're sending you a signal. And the same in business. Yeah. You've just got to be, you want real-time accounting, you want to know um, you know, you want to see how you how things are moving, yeah. um, and identify those and make decisions. Um, so you, you've really got to be um, yeah. The more diligent, more observant, the quicker you react, um, the better. Probably the better business person you're going to be. Yeah. All right, well thank you very much for taking your time for this interview. I think, you know, one of the things that comes out of it for me is that, you, you know, you're a great example of a person that's come from a humble background, but you've learnt on your feet, you've been adaptable, you've been willing to try different things, mm. and you've worked hard and um, been incredibly successful. So a real inspiration to us all, so thank you for your time. Thanks, Bill.